All right, so um, I'm Andre. I'm going to tell you how chromium is being made. Um, heads up, uh, if you have any questions, particularly like I said something you didn't understand, I'm not going to come back. So you're better off raising your hand, or maybe um, since I'm going to see everybody immediately, uh, just interrupt me and shout what exactly you do not understand. Um, I try to accommodate enough time for questions. Uh, but I might also be going too fast, so it's also okay to stop me or tell me that I should go a bit slower. Um, all right, with that, let's go. Uh, first of all, a huge disclaimer, I'm here on vacation because I like Munich. Oh, that's hat for Munich. Um, even though I work for a company you probably heard about, um, this is not the opinion of my company. In fact, we have a lot of people who would strongly disagree with me on quite a lot of these issues. Uh, the debates are ongoing virtually every day uh, during lunch hours, how to do things better. Um, on one hand side it's fun, on the other hand side it's, um, you're always sometimes proven wrong. So I um, welcome corrections to my talk. All right, with this, let's start. So this is this weird slide that I have to tell you what I'll be telling you for the rest of this time. Um, basically, I'll show you how Chromium developers operate. Um, raise your hand if you're actually an individual contributor in this room. Raise your hand if you're an engineer, you code. <laughs> okay, um, how many people actually um, manage like releases, like cut releases or like do technical program management or something like this? Okay, well, so my talk is proportionately about the same ratio as I just asked questions. So um, towards the end, I will focus more about on TPM kind of work, uh, but it will permeate the whole talk. Um, so TPMs, if you want, you can zoom out and um, join in the second half of the talk. Um, all right, so why is it me here? Um, well, first of all, C++, and I spent a lot of time doing C++, like the hardcore C++. Didn't sleep much, but it was a lot of fun, um, particularly deciphering this crap. Um, and that was before Clang became a thing, so I had to use GCC 4.4 or 2, and boost libraries in PL, if somebody still remembers that stuff, uh, and wait for long compile times in my Pentium 4, or whatever it was at the time. Um, the other reason why I think I'm a bit qualified is uh, I spent some time learning from Google people how to do Chromium development uh, by working on infrastructure. Um, I don't actually climb poles, um, but I kind of like to think about it. Um, all right, so what's Chromium? Um, do you know the difference in Chromium and Chrome? Because it's like a frequent confusion. Um, so let me clarify just quickly. So the colorful one is Chrome. That's the branded version which you probably use. Um, but if you're diehard um, open source, person um, and you hate DRM, you probably use Chromium or Firefox without DRM if it exists. Um, but that's pretty much the difference. Um, most of the code for the right hand side is open source. And the right hand side is basically that thing plus a few closed source stuff we cannot open source. Like think Flash. We would like to open source it but there's so many bugs nobody wants to see it. Um, my personal opinion. All right. Um, What's infrastructure? Now, people use this word, it mean, means different things. Some people think DevOps. Uh, this is actually not DevOps, um, particularly because I'm actually not deploying, like Chromium isn't really um, a service which runs in the cloud for you, although it has some parts running in the cloud. Um, I think of infrastructure more like a walkway at the airport. Um, you basically do the normal thing. You keep walking like this. Um, but what walkway allows you to do is the same thing, but faster. It's more efficient. Um, Clearly some people will stumble and so on, but what really infrastructure does, it, it allows sort of increase the average productivity of things. Some things may go worse. For example, clearly walking um, outside of the walkway is safer, like you can't really fall. It's much more difficult to fall than no moving parts. But at the same time, uh, you'll go faster if you use the walkway. So that's how I see infrastructure, and that's what my talk is really about. How do you build walkways which strike the right trade-off at increasing your productivity, but at the same time, not increasing like boringness, annoying bureaucracy and so on. And it's a difficult balance to strike. But I'll try to describe the kind of decisions we've made to support these two cases. So you, I'm not sure how many of you actually still remember this guy. Um, okay, I can see people remember. He used to shout, developers, 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 developers. I can't do it anymore, you have to really sweat. Um, not hard enough. Um, but this is one part. And the other part is, I call them release managers. Um, they have different names, but this is the people who are responsible for actually shipping, okay? You can code as much code as you want, but if you don't ship, well, it's all useless. 
Um, so for a successful product, you need both. You have to help both. Um, so our infrastructure really has to work for both. And it's often at odds uh, what one group wants and what the other wants. So let's see what they want. Um, well, as a developer, you like to create a feature as soon as you can, land it, and go home. Or, I don't know, play a game, whatever you do. Um, you also sometimes like to refactor code, maybe. Um, as a release manager, they actually they care about features, but they also care about shipping on time, because they really want to release that feature that they promised to clients and so on. Um, and another very important thing, particularly for Chrome, is um, lots of security bugs. I mentioned Adobe Flash. It used to be our number one cause for zero-day releases. And releasing them on time, as soon as we discover, as soon as possible, before it's being exploited um, in the public, is really important. Um, that means that, that puts really strong um, strong, basically that puts huge limitations on what developers can do. Um, so you cannot just like write code, you know, drop it uh, in the common code base and just uh, keep your fingers crossed that it works. Or what Alexandrescu calls prayer-based programming. Or prayer-oriented programming, sorry. All right. Um, so release, you might have heard about release structure. I will mention a bit later. But that's how kind of Chromium works. We first test it in the binary, uh, sorry, canary, dev, and so on. Um, but once you think about releases, developers also are uh, somewhat concerned about them. If some release was cut, did my feature make it there? That's a really important question to ask. Um, the other one is, suppose it did make it there, like, it crashed. Was it me? Was it something else? Um, the same thing for, for release managers. They, they could see, like, the crash rate of this new release is, like, really high, much higher than normal. Um, who caused it? What caused it? Which, which commit? Um, and ideally, as soon as possible, you want to figure it out, because it's real users are suffering. And in case of Chromium, that means millions of people have crashes every day. So this is the questions which I'm trying to address in this presentation. Um, so that concludes the first introduction. Are there any questions? All right, let's go second. Um, now, this is more for developers. Uh, it's really 101. You know, this is American stuff, like 101 course, like basic beginner stuff. Um, I'm going to describe here a sort of idealized, a happiest time of a developer, how it typically works. Um, I think many of you are familiar with code review. Uh, some of you may even practice it at work. I think it's now much more common. Uh, when I started, it wasn't so common. In my first company, we didn't do code review, and I tried to do it, and it was considered um, a huge developer drag on productivity. So um, for those who are still working in such a place, I'm going to convince you that's not the case. All right, so how does Chrome developer work? Uh, first of all, he gets this thing called Depot Tools. And you may wonder, what the hell is that? Ah, let's see. It's our SDK. It's an SDK to make Chrome. So because Chrome is so complex, we have a lot of tooling, which we stick on this SDK, um, which really mostly is like open source stuff you heard about, SVN. Anybody remembers SVN? OK, good. Uh, I'm happy it's finally died. Um, Git, of course, uh, and a bunch of other tools, like uh, C++ compilers and so on. Um, it's really like this. That's what that repository contains. It contains a bunch of stuff that people dumped over the years, um, from linters like C++, PyLints, and so on, and some other more esoteric things. All right, so that's what the Depot Tools is. Uh, the most important thing for understanding of this talk is it contains two things. Um, one is gclient, which is, if, to, if we started today, it would be git submodules. Uh, they're not completely ready for us, but that's, I think, the closest for understanding. Um, so you know what Git Submodules is? Anybody not knows what Git Submodules is? All right, so I, let me explain. Um, basically, if you, have, you know what Git is, right? <laughs> Good. So if you have a Git repo, sometimes you may be you want to depend on another library from somewhere else in some other Git repo. Um, so you can do so informally, just telling the users, ha, ah, by the way, if you want to compile my stuff, go to this link, download this stuff, and do something, something, something. Or you can just add it to your repository and track it like a soft link. So from one repository, say, I depend on this, some other person's library. Um, you can do it through source code management. So that's what gclient does. It's an ancient tool, because when we started, uh, git submodules didn't exist. And the other thing which we have is git cl. And CL here stands for, like, really think of a patch or one commit. So as you develop first code in your local machine, and then eventually it becomes a commit. Uh, at Google, we call it CL change list, but you can really think of it as a patch. So this is addition on top of Git. These are two most important tools. So let's go what developer does. Developer presumably has them in pass. He checks out the code base. Um, you got to wait a bit. 
Um, maybe a bit more. Um, actually, usually just go to micro kitchen and I don't know, get some food or something. Uh, it takes really long time. Uh, it used to take even longer. So, first problem. Um, checkout is actually exceptionally slow. Um, there used to be time, I think, when I joined, we still use SVN. Um, if you didn't use any kind of optimization and hacks, it would take like 40 minutes. So, and uh, remember, this is Google internal Google network, which means fast network. Okay, it still takes 40 minutes. Like, so it like downloads stuff, but SVN is just slow. Uh, it never saturates network, and even the super low latency is just forever. So um, this is real. Like, I spent a lot of time there. Um, it's also fun. All right, so slow SVN, if you don't know what it is, it's good. We migrated to Git. It was a huge project. Um, the problem with Git is it, it has the whole history with it. And I know there's shallow checkouts, but we can discuss later. Um, the biggest problem we, have, we hit immediately is we need a lot more hard drive space. Um, the other thing is, even so, Git is still slow. Um, it will see why. We have gigabytes of data. Um, so how do you solve the problem? Well, you buy big HDDs. Still slow. You buy SSDs. Luckily, they're cheap now. Uh, you, ideally, like 256 at least, just for the Chrome and all the stuff it depends on. Um, Git is still slow. It has been slow. And we actually are working not only Chromium, but like other teams like Microsoft, uh, also internal Google teams. Uh, we're trying to make Git faster. Um, I think 218 released last month is going to make it like a lot faster um, if you use new servers like GitHub and Google. Uh, but that's really what we're working on. And this is like sort of easy hanging fruit, right? As a developer, you like you Git pull, Git clone, whatever, many times a day. You don't want to wait 40 minutes. So that's important. Um, and it's very easy to translate to actual cache saved for managers. So you can do that. Um, finally, future, I hope, we'll have virtual file systems. But it's not there yet. All right. So once we finished, and I think by now it takes about 10 minutes if you're at Google to check out, pretty much as long as my talk took so far, um, you get 13 gigabytes of just um, like compressed Git archive histories, a variety of repos, and actual 10 gigabytes on disk checkout of stuff. Like think CPP files, uh, header files, JavaScript, Java, manifest, all kind of stuff that you've heard about. So. What do you do then? Let's just say that you are a very simple developer. You take your local editor, whatever you use in your local system. I hope not Notepad on Windows. At least not Notepad Plus, please. Um, but you commit something locally. Um, and then you upload it for review. And you wait. Um, but the most important thing here is that um, the review is mandatory for us. We will say later why. Um, so you get this nice URL. And you can really think of a code review, or what I call CL, is like a pull request in GitHub. Um, and it looks somewhat similar, I guess, somewhat similar. Uh, we use Gavit for code review. Um, I'll explain why later. But it's kind of like GitHub. I don't know how many of you use Gavit. Anybody use Gavit? Oh, OK, OK. Um, have you used new Gavit interface? OK, so uh, Chromium hated Gavit interface. So we, could, we asked Gavit team to create a better interface. So now it's a better interface. I'm not sure about that, but, but it looks newer. Anyway, this is Gavit interface at the top. The code's there at the bottom. Uh, it didn't fit in the screenshot. But the most important thing is uh, these are my reviewers over here um, and my project. But um, what I'm really waiting for here is this. I need label code review. Um, in order to land anything in Chromium, like commit something, we need code review approval. Um, so while we're waiting for code review, that may take a long time depending on the reviewers. Um, you may be wondering, wait, so I made this change. Does this actually work? I mean, sometimes you know for sure it works, and then it doesn't. Um, it's even worse when I personally work on Linux, but you know, Chrome works on many machines and platforms like iOS, Android. Um, does it work elsewhere? Um, and this is a difficult thing to answer, right? I mean, you can connect like probably Android phone for your machine. Are you going to connect iPhone too? No, you can't. You need a Mac. Uh, what about other devices? It's really, really hard. So um, this is really an um, important problem. So we solved it by means of this. Each box here is um, basically a specific configuration. Just think of it like Linux 64-bit, or like Windows 32-bit, or um, Android something. Uh, of course, this being C++, we have a bunch of um, ASAN. Are you familiar with what ASAN is? So basically, it's like uh, we have a bunch of fuzzing, testing, checking that memory access is correct, and so on. Um, so these are covered by this, we call them tribots. But it's really, you create a change, and then you ask automated system to test it for you on multiple different uh, platforms. Um, of course, ideally, you want to test them on all of them. 
Uh, the problem is damn expensive. <laughs> like, we have so many platforms, we cannot uh, test them at all. So we just test on the, the most important and the likeliest to break uh, systems. Um, remember, if the test never fails, the test is useless. Just think about it. Like, if you wrote a test that tests something, but it never ever fails, you might have as well not written it ever. Uh, because it's not really useful. Uh, in fact, it's probably harmful because it runs and takes time. So this principle, well, we try to upheld. It's not easy, um, but it's very important. And that's why we do not run all the tests we have with all the platforms. They're not all that useful. Do you have a phase and a test on all of them? Sorry? Later on, do you have a phase and a test actually? All right, so the, 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 thank you. The, the question was, do we test it uh, later on? Um, I will come to that later. All right, so sometimes, um, yes? Do you use hardware as well, or only software-based uh, cloud-based testing? Like Both. Uh, Both. Uh, so the question was, do we use um, only software-based testing, like I don't know, emulators and stuff, um, or do we also run it on hardware? We do both. Uh, also in pre-commit phase. So during the review, we do run on actual uh, Android phones and on iOS phones, for example. Um, all right, so let me go next. Oh, pardon me. So the other thing is, as I mentioned, we don't test on all of them. So we, if you know for sure that you're debugging, say, a bug in some weird configuration, you can select and test additionally on that specific configuration you want. Um, that's frequently used, but that's basically what we have UI for, so you can choose a try job. Um, now, just to be clear for those people who use Garrett, um, this stuff is our Chromium integration into Garrett. Uh, stock Garrett you get does not have this feature. It's our infrastructure to build on top. Uh, which you see, it's very important to have access to open source stuff because it means we can see Garrett source and contribute to it. Um, so you'll see it more later. All right, let's go back to developer. Now, I assume somebody came along, reviewed our stuff, and gave us some comments like, fix this typo or something. So the rest is familiar probably to all developers. You fix the stuff, amend your commit, and you upload it again and send emails so that the person gets to see that you want their attention. All right. Um, now suppose you're a reviewer, so you got the review of the same change again, right? Presumably there's some bug fixes as you asked to be fixed. Um, but suppose the change is big, like it's like 200 lines, okay? And you asked to fix like two typos, um, but, you received the fix, but you received the request to review it again like the next day. Do you still remember everything from the previous version? Are you gonna review it again from scratch? Like both, kind of, both options kind of suck. Like on one hand side, um, reviewing it completely is a good thing, on the other hand side, it seems like a waste of time. So, of course, you can see diff between the diffs. So you can see diff between two different versions of patches, and if there are base artifacts, we also highlight them separately. But basically what you see is this, and I, I don't know if GitHub finally has it. Um, at least a year ago, that's what drove me nuts. I would leave comments on pull requests, and then the person sends me another pull request, you know, updated one, and I cannot see whether the person fixed that thing I asked him to fix or not without checking it myself. Like, you know, reviewing the whole sale from scratch. That really drives me nuts. So um, I think that's an important feature. Um, anyway, let's go next. So suppose the reviewer is happy. So he gave us code review plus one, or what we call LGTM at Google. Looks good to me. Um, different names, but the same thing. Basically, the reviewer says, good to go. What do you do? Um, well, you don't want to submit something before the tests are finished, right? I mean, you don't want to break other people. So you basically have to run tests and wait and wait until they finish. And they take hours, sometimes worse. Uh, I think we ought to keep it on hour. So in order to see if you change just on those standard configurations, does not break anything, you gotta wait for one hour. Um, that's a long time to wait, and we don't want you to keep refreshing the page. All right, slide detour. Um, how many of you heard of BuildBot? Okay. Poor people, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we used to use BuildBot before. I mean, don't get me wrong, I actually like BuildBot. Um, for small projects, it's great. Uh, we used to use BuildBot before. For our load, some developers actually kept refreshing the page with F5. And somebody was really smart, and he thought, hey, I can make an extension for Chrome. And he started refreshing the page every 10 seconds just you know, to see his job turning green. That's what he wants. Um, uh, the problem is he DDoSed the whole BuildBot server because it's single process Python, and you saw how efficient Python is. <laughs> um, so we migrating away from BuildBot. Uh, I will not allocate much time for that, but if you have questions about BuildBot, you can ask me after the talk, because I, I don't think it will be extremely interesting to everybody. Uh, but that's a um, real true story back in 2014. Um, another joke we have at Google is I forgot how to count that low, 
Um, so if you say like you have 10 queries per second, that's like nothing in our scale, but for BuildBot, it was really hard to sustain five queries per second uh, on a super beefy hardware. So um, what are you migrating to? Huh? What are you migrating to? Uh, to our custom build system, unfortunately. <coughs> but it's open source. So you can ask me more about it later. All right. So we don't want to wait and you know hit refreshing, <laughs> hit the button for refresh. So we have a sorry. Yes. So we have a system called commit queue. It's really kind of dumb, uh, but you just tell it, hey, you please test the stuff, and if it's all green, commit it for me. Um, it also will check that there are no conflicts and so on. Um, but that's what the life of a developer is. Okay. Uh, finally, there was a question here before. What happens after you commit? Well, after you commit landed, suppose like your commit, maybe you are Yoshiki at Chrome.org. Um, your commit landed here. Um, there are two commits on top of it, like something else landed after you. Um, we run now, see these columns here, these colorful things? Uh, each column here is a configuration. Uh, so for example, this is um, actually Windows 32 Builder, which builds kind of official Chrome and runs basic tests in it. Um, as you can see, sometimes builders are kind of slow. So they are not able to keep up with this plate of commits. So sometimes um, they will test four commits at once. But at this stage, after commit, we test on all configurations we have. Okay. Um, previously, we would test a single patch on standard configurations, and we have hardware to do that. Uh, testing all configurations is very expensive, so we only test after you actually committed something. So all your intermediary uh, attempts wouldn't be tested and wasting our resources. Um, so that's actually a number of configurations. Like each of the square here is the one of the configurations, and these are all public ones. I'm not showing internal ones. There are a few internals, but not so many. Maybe like 20, 30 or something. All right. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes if the rate of commits is too high, we would merge, and so that means if it fails, we don't know exactly why it failed. Like maybe there are five commits, there are five potential uh, people to blame. All right. So that's the life of developer. Uh, any questions about developer? All right. Um, this will be the last section before the break. Um, please bear with me. So the talk was about scaling. So far, what I described to you isn't so much, hasn't been much about scale. Well, except number of configurations. But it's actually, frankly, not very unusual. Like I, I know a few companies in Munich who actually have so many different configurations because they ship the same software to different clients, so they have like a few things customized, and so they may actually have like six different uh, configurations which they test and build. Um, but what I think really uh, puts Chromium aside from uh, other projects is actually how many different contributors are sticking their code into our code base, uh, and how frequently they do so. So. I split the sort of scaling into two parts. Uh, one is code quality, and another one is product quality. Uh, code quality is more like if you're reading the code, and, you, and you're wondering, what the f you know the word? WTFs per minute, it's, a, it's the metric of quality of the code. So if you have, like in my case, 60, it means like probably I should go uh, take rest or ask the person to rewrite it. Um, everybody has different benchmarks. But so this part is about really WTFs per minute with respect to code. And the second section would be about uh, product quality, which is more ab about if a Chrome breaks on you as a user, you're wondering, what the fuck, Google? Um, that's the second part. All right, so let's dive into code quality. So let's think about first, how do we ensure a good code? I mean, clearly good code is subjective, all right? Um, I understand that, so the idea here is more like avoiding the most horrible code, okay? Um, we already mentioned one um, easy solution that is code review. At the very least, a reviewer must be somewhat happy uh, with your code. Um, so for example, if you send something for review, um, you may send it to your buddy, and your buddy just likes you, and he just stamps whatever you send him. Uh, we don't really want that either, right? Uh, another thing, remember, we are open source product. Uh, we don't want random buddies from the internet just stamping um, a code. Uh, you definitely don't want to run their code in your browser and your machines, right? With your banking credentials. So we don't do that. So we have a notion of something called a committer. A committer is from old days. It's like when you did SVN commit. The word stuck. Um, it really means somebody who is allowed to grant a code review plus one. Everybody can write a comment like, I hate your code, or this is wrong, or something. Uh, but only committers can actually say, this code is approved, and their vote counts. 
So who is the committer? Well, it's like somebody we trust. Uh, at the very least, that person should have written um, some number of high quality changes himself or herself. Um, so the problem is how do you, like, you start with nobody as a committer, right? So you have to, like, how do you, how do you keep up? How do you add people to committers? Um, so here comes the second thing which will be going throughout my presentation today. It's process, or you can think of it as culture. Um, so one part is tooling. That's like easy to understand for most developers. Like, well, you, you use Git to like Git push, Git pull, something like this. And the other part is more like a culture. It's the set of typical uh, behaviors that you expect from people. So one of them is committers. If the three existing committers think that somebody is ready to become a committer, they can nominate that person. That person also becomes a committer. Um, the bar is usually pretty high. Um, I, I didn't get to be a committer for like a year, I think. Um, but admittedly, my C++ became rusty, so it's kind of fair. I had to um, get back to C++ at the time. All right, so that's how committers work. Um, this is a system, similar system to Debian, if you're familiar with Debian. Uh, they also require three people to sort of approve a change and so on. Um, so that's what we adopted. Uh, very important thing, if you're a Googler, even though it's, well, primarily Google project, you're not automatically a committer. So if we just hired you, or maybe you're an intern, or you just like a new person in Chrome project, you're not a committer. You are in the same shoes as some random person from the internet who decided to send us a change. Okay? Um, so in this case, we play fair. Um, if you want to be a committer, you have to deserve to be a committer. So we also give you Chrome.org address. Uh, you may choose to keep your own like company or personal email, but we can also give you Chrome.org address if you like. I don't know if it matters, but free Gmail account. All right, so that's about committers. Any questions about committers? All right, let's go next. Oh yeah, go question. Can you be also degraded because you can be upgraded once you reach and you get kicked out if you you have too many buddies? All right, so the question was, can you actually get kicked out? Yes. Um, I think we had a few cases where we actually had to kick out somebody. Um, uh, though usually, to be honest, uh, usually it's not because you submitted bad code, but because you are um, behaving inappropriately. Uh, so one example is, um, if you're behaving like Linux Torvalds on mailing list of Linux. <laughs> All right, so those who read know what I'm talking about. If you didn't read, basically, uh, we're trying to be inclusive. Um, I, I know I often use the word he for developer. It's not quite correct. And I know that actually non he's developer here, I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to uh, remove this habit. Um, but this is just one example. Like some people would say like this code is stupid. That's not a really good way to review code. Uh, we have uh, community uh, behaving guidelines, uh, particularly with respect to code review, how you're supposed to um, review code. Like instead of saying this code is complete shit, you have to say what exactly should be changed so, um, so this code gets better and so on. Um, so I think it's like more like civil mindedness is required. Uh, so most people who get kicked out of committership is because they, they just were not really civil. Like we do not want to, we don't want them to alienate other potential contributors uh, to our code base. Right. Any other questions? Yes. How many committers? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, but if, if, if you look at the code base, I think we had like more than a thousand committers last year. Um, commit, sorry, contributors. I, I'm not actually sure how many committers we have. Um, I think it would be fair to say that more, at least a half of a contributors would be a committer. Uh, because most people, who, like, if you're a committer, most likely you're working for a company uh, which deals with Chrome browser, uh, one way or another. Like Samsung, for example, for their phones, they customize the browser. Um, so Opera, which, because it's Chromium. Yes? Well, question. Uh, are the committers somehow specialized for some? Uh, uh, so the question was, committers specialized, like, for which area of expertise they have? Um, yeah, I'll get to that later. Um, very, very shortly. All right, so this is C++ Meetup. So far, actually, we didn't deal with C++. Um, Chromium is a pretty big C++ project, but it has a lot of other stuff, like Python for mostly infrastructure stuff and tests. Uh, we have Java for Android. Um, I'm pretty sure we have Swift for iOS. Um, so, you know, a variety of languages. And of course, JavaScript uh, for UI of, um, and various pages of Chromium. So, yes, clearly, specialization is important. Um, but let's just focus for a moment on C++, particularly C++, because I like to pick on C++, um, uh, because I wrote meta templates before, and I wrote them for my company. I should have been fired, uh, but I wasn't. Um, but I really should have been, because the code is completely unreadable. Like, if anybody has to change it, then 
it's like really bad. Even though I left some comments, which I thought were useful, I'm after reading it a year later, nah. <laughs> nah. So if, if, you, if you know what Sfinai means, I would actually consider not hiring you. I, I, I'm kidding, but abusing Sfinai is, is, um, is really uh, tough. All right, thank you. So C++ is difficult. Um, there are lots of features which we want to discourage people from using. Now, let me be clear, some features are useful depending on the context. And sometimes you have to write assembly because that's the only way to do it, or the only efficient way to do it. For example, if you're optimizing some codec for decoding video or something, yeah, you write it in assembly or whatever like unreadable C++ or C or whatever code that takes to, have to get the highest performance. Uh, but if you write some code which is not in a hard pass, you're not supposed to use any of that hard to read code. So we have a style guide for this. Um, I know many people like gain style guides, uh, particularly people who are extremely productive coders. Um, when they're working on their own, you know, they know how to use templates correctly. They know how to use row pointers correctly. Um, so they like using them. They hate unique pointer. Um, we discourage that strongly uh, because one person may know it, the other person may not think about it at the right moment. So um, that's why we have a style guide. Remember, I was talking about trade-offs. This is the kind of trade-off. It limits some people's productivity. At the same time, it increases productivity of others. Um, this is the kind of trade-offs which we'll see more and more later. So, of course, we optimize code for reading as opposed to writing. Um, so side effect, as I mentioned, <laughs> templates are kind of discouraged. Uh, we use templates for basic stuff, like we have our own vector implementation, um, which doesn't double every time. How many know why not double? Yeah. Right, if you don't know why not, why doubling is probably the worst possible growth strategy for, uh, for vector, Google it. <laughs> um, I won't focus there. But my point is we use basic templates of like basic stuff, uh, but we don't go beyond generalizing for the sake of generalizing. Uh, sometimes, in fact, we would copy paste the code. Um, but we'll see about it later. Another thing, bonus point, and why we sometimes copy paste is compile is actually faster. If you know about templates, you have to include through header files. If you change a header file, like you change the vector header file, you have to recompile everything, because almost everything uses vectors. Um, so that's why we won't avoid templates as much as we can. Uh, remember, this is a huge project. You saw, this, you saw the sizes of our repository. There are, I think, at least 100 megabytes of like C++ files. And even if you remove spaces there and like comments, it's still pretty huge for a compiler to go through. So compile time is, I will get to it later. So um, let's go next problem, which I think was asked before. Not everybody knows the whole code base. In fact, I think from like after the first four months, the code base was too large that actually nobody knew the whole thing. Um, in fact, I think today there's nobody who knows even 20% of code base? I really doubt it. Um, not even committers. So, and remember, we have different uh, languages here. Um, the other thing is we have multiple repos, and so it's, uh, it's a bit more difficult there. So, how do we deal with the fact that uh, you can send me a review? I'm a committer because I'm actually working in infrastructure, and I know very well Chrome infrastructure, like how do we test it? But I don't really know implementation of internal process communication uh, framework. So, how do we make sure that I don't approve changes to that framework. Uh, we call it, um, hold on. <laughs> so if you look at the Git history, um, particularly in a specific file or folder, you can see that usually there's sort of a LRU semantics there. Like the person who least, most recently modified it is usually the person who modified it the most overall. So um, if you just look at Git log uh, for a specific file, you can see immediately who is probably the best pair of eyes uh, to look at your change. And so we formalized this thing, calling it owners, or owner of some file or directory. So owners is like an, it's, um, it's applied to either folder or file, which are way in recursively, and you can fairly customize it. It's format is a bit like this. Uh, so you can see, for example, Hans uh, line 10 owns probably the whole, the whole directory from here and recursively down, uh, while some people um, own only some files. So that's what owners is. Um, again, it's a formal construct. So that means if you, need to, your, if you need to change files in that folder, you need to get approval from one of the owners of that folder or of that file. Um, downside takes longer time. Right? If you can ask your buddy for any review, it's awesome. If you have to wait for that person who maybe lives, I don't know, in Australia and you're in Munich, that person might already be asleep. So you gotta wait 24 hours. That's a downside. As I said, trade-offs everywhere. Um, in here on balance, we choose owners because it ensures quality of code and readability later. 
but downside is way longer. Any questions about owners? Yes, please. Do you have a maximum time until somebody has to review the code? Um, so the question was, do we, like, do we put any limits in uh, how, how, how long until somebody has to review the code? No, we don't have formal. Uh, we don't have formal rules. Unlike, so owner's rules are formal. Uh, the expected review duration or delay is informal. As I mentioned, this is more like a cultural thing, the expectation that at least within a day. However, it within a day if you are a Googler. Um, we have lots of owners who are non-Googlers who may work in different companies in different schedule and they may not work full-time in Chromium. Um, it's okay to sometimes find another owner if you don't get a reply. It's also okay to ping. So we would, both, we would post a comment on the code review, ping, and then friendly ping, and then violent ping. Um, but if you wait for more than a week, that something is wrong. Uh, the other thing is, as I mentioned, owners are recursive. Sometimes you may disable recursion, but owners are recursive. So if you, get, um, if you don't get the owner from like this specific folder, you can try to ask the owner of the bigger root of files and folders. Um, anyway, in general, it kind of works out. But sure, some people complain. And sometimes it helps to know uh, owners in person. <laughs> so we travel a lot. All right. Any other questions about owners? All right, so um, I'm not sure if everybody likes refactoring. I personally like that, but it's not always the most exciting thing. Um, however, as the project grows, there's more and more craft accumulated, like some leftovers, like um, to do, somebody forgot to clean up some stuff he meant to do, so in 2015, guilty of that. Um, we want to encourage people to clean it up. And of course, if cleaning up takes like a half a year project, Nobody's going to do it, or at least nobody's saying. So it's important to have easy way to refactor code. Um, of course, removing like stale to-dos, updating docs is the easy one because you can just change the file; it doesn't affect anybody. You know, you can. It's very easy. The bigger problem is if you really want to refactor something that really, really matters, like bad API. Like imagine um, an API which requires you to do two calls, where like the API always requires a call to do two calls. You can replace them as one call if they're always in the same sequence. Um, such refactoring is extremely useful, it increases the ability, but how do you know you're not breaking everything? And the ease, of easy, the ease of refactoring is really, from my perspective, depends on primarily on how many repositories um, you have to write changes for. So if you have a single repo, which is what Google internally used to use, still kind of using, uh, you have a single repo, you can just search for all occurrences of that string that you're looking for. Um, and if that fails, you know, run test everywhere and that's it. Just one commit. Maybe it takes you like one day to test, but it's all in your hands. And you can land this change atomically. Um, if you follow what Facebook does with Mercurial, um, there's a big discussion why Facebook, for example, prefers one single repository as opposed to um, many repositories, and uh, you could read more about it. Uh, one of the reasons is really easy refactoring. So let me just illustrate what happens if you have n plus one repos. So we call it um, dense, because suppose you, you have, first you have to implement a new interface while keeping the old one working. Right? Then you go and update all your users to start using your interface. And then keep your fingers crossed that nobody reverts your change. Because right? then, like, then you have to do everything from scratch, and it happens. So ultimately, it's at the very least, if you're very lucky, it's n plus one commit for n repos. Um, and that's why um, we try to keep everything in one repo. That's why we have a, a huge repo. That's really number one reason. So it's easy to make changes. So as I mentioned, that's our goal. Keep as many repos uh, as few repos as we can. Yes, please, question. Uh, you said you have external partners which uh, use Chromium and they have their own repos. How do you communicate these things? Um, so it's Git. Um, so the question was, how do external partners work with us? Um, now, I'm answering here for Chromium. There's also something called Chrome OS, which is Chromium plus the whole Linux kernel and some stuff. I'm not talking about that thing. It's a whole other topic. It's more complex. So just for Chromium, we discourage people from having their own feature branches. I will mention it later. So um, if they want to contribute to us, they have to use our code review and lend it to our main repository. Okay. Um, so what I mean here is repository, I, I mean here more like dependent repositories. Uh, one example, you probably all heard of V8. It's the JavaScript engine which Chromium uses. But V8 is not, the on, it's not only used by Chromium, it's also used by Node.js, for example. 
So we actually have, Node.js has dependence on V8, which I don't know how they do, but Chromium depends on V8 repository. So it means if Chromium changes some interface, which V8 depends on, well, you have to go and change, like, you have to go through this dense I mentioned. So I'm talking about functional dependencies, uh, not uh, forks of two different, uh, of, of the same repository. Does that make sense? All right. Um, that's all for the first part of the talk. Um, okay. Question. So normally the problem is why do you want to split your stuff into several repositories, especially if you have a layered uh, software product and you want to, for different customers, uh, you create uh, different sets. You, you want to reconfigure your product, which is some is more, some is less, mm -hmm. some has other parts which the other don't want. And uh, then if you have a single repository, then the only way to do it is that you create a big superset where that everything is in and all the configuration is, uh, is managed in this superset. And this is like, if you are working on, on some customer issues, then you have the entire stuff there, which is 99% doesn't matter for you if you do that. So, uh, and how you would solve that problem in that case? Without but, having several repositories and able to split them into smaller ones. So let me try to summarize your question. <laughs> Uh, so basically the question is, sometimes you have to customize for different um, things, for different clients. And I think I will use the example of Chrome OS here. Um, Chrome OS has a bunch of partners, like, I don't know, most hardware manufacturers except for Apple. Uh, they, create, they create laptops uh, which become Chromebooks, and so they have their own chipsets there and their own customizations they want to add so that they can sell their own stuff better. Um, and Google itself now, I think, ships Chromebooks, our own Chromebooks. So. Um, how do we customize all these individual configurations and maybe drivers and so on? Um, so as I mentioned, Chromium uh, keeps everything into one, in one repository, uh, all the configurations. So if it's um, iOS, it's on one repository, like its own main repository. Uh, the only thing we don't keep there is something which is highly reusable outside, like V8 or WebRTC you might have heard about. Um, so that's Chromium's approach. Chrome OS, on the other hand, um, does the exact opposite and the one you described. Uh, Chrome OS actually creates sometimes individual repositories for different like chipsets and so on, and sometimes different branches. Uh, and their life is even more difficult because they have to maintain it for five years. Uh, it's more nightmarish. I hope I answered your question. So that, like, basically, there's no real solution here. It's, it's always a trade-off. So for Chromium, the trade-off is more like we want to keep everything in one repository so we can code search it. Um, for Chrome OS, it's just so expensive to maintain all one place, so they create different branches. But it's also not easy <laughs> to manage them all. All right, I, let's call it a break. I don't know how many minutes we have break, um, but break time. Thank you.